Brandon asked that we talk about a couple of subjects here, and for the first hour, I'll be talking about Luther's view of church and state, and for the last hour after our dinner, I'll be talking kind of a conclusion of the Reformation theme. It'll be titled Semper Reformanda. Those of you who are military know that Semper Fi means always faithful for the Marines. Semper Paratus means always prepared for the Coast Guard. Semper Reformanda means always reforming. Do we still need the Reformation today? I'll ask you about those five solas that we talked about a few weeks ago and see how many remember them. But at any rate, we'll just look at the solas and see whether they're in danger, whether they're under attack today. A couple of preliminary considerations in regard to Luther's view of church and state. First of all, we're going to be talking about a lot about law here tonight, but Luther's primary emphasis is the gospel. Luther believed that the scriptures are divided into law and gospel, and the law is not simply the Old Testament. There's a lot of gospel in the Old Testament, and there's a lot of law in the New Testament. Rather, the law is what God demands of us, saying, this is what you must do for God. The gospel says, this is what God has done for you. And even though we're going to be talking about law in terms of Luther's view of church and state and Luther's view of law and government, that doesn't mean that our primary emphasis is not the gospel. That's just not the part we're going to be focusing on today. What about law? Luther said that the law has three uses today. You know, we read where Paul tells us that you are not under law, but under grace. Do we agree with that? Of course we agree with it. It's in Scripture. We don't disagree with the Scripture. The question is, what does Paul mean by those words? Does he mean that we're free to go out and murder and commit all sorts of offenses like this? There was even a movement at that time, the antinomians, they were called, or anti-law would be a good way of describing that, who said that, this is ridiculous reasoning, but basically they said, well, grace is a good thing, right? Now, the more we sin, the more grace God has to manufacture to cover it. So we should sin more. That way there will be more grace. That's a good thing. Paul says simply, shall we therefore sin more that grace may abound? And he gives a two-word refutation that is all that is necessary. God forbid. So the law is relevant today. You might put it this way. The law cannot save us. But the law is nevertheless instrumental in our salvation. And Luther and Calvin both would say that the law has three uses today. First use is what we call the civil use. Sometimes we call that the curb. By the curb, we mean like something that restrains us, a curb that keeps you from going onto the sidewalk and so on. The civil use is the part of the law that where we instruct people and in what they should and shouldn't do and where parliaments and legislatures and county commissions and the like take as much as they can of God's law as well as they can understand it and enact it into statutes and ordinances for the sake of restraining the exercise of sin. It doesn't take sin away doesn't take away the desire to sin, but it makes it unprofitable to sin. And you may be thinking about committing a crime, and then you think, well, but if I do, there's a good chance I'll get arrested and have to spend five years in jail and have to give back the stuff I stole anyway, so I guess it just isn't worth it. Well, the law therefore restrains the exercise of sin in this way. Second use, the pedagogical use, that we call the ruler, that the law is, as Paul says, our schoolmaster to lead us unto Christ. Through the law, we see our sinful condition. And in seeing that sinful condition, we know that we don't measure up to God's standards. And therefore, we need grace. I always like the story of the elderly lady, wealthy lady, who was having a portrait of her made and she told the artist, now you take your time in this, I'm paying you good money, and I want a portrait that does me justice. He said, lady, you don't need justice, you need mercy. <laughs> As do we all. 
And then the third use of the law, the teaching use for believers, the mirror. The law for believers shows us the mind of Christ and the will of God, and in the process of sanctification, brings us into grace and brings us into Christian maturity. Another distinction that Luther makes is between revelation and reason. God has revealed his truth in the scriptures. That's what we call special revelation. But then he's also revealed his truth through the power of human reason, the rules of evidence, the rules of logic and the like. And that is also a gift of God. But Luther would say that in the one revelation, that is the primary use in the church. Reason is the primary use within state and in the public arena. The way I look at it would be like this, that back during the battle over homosexuals in the military, with my impeccable sense of timing, I wrote my research paper at the Air War College on the case against homosexuals in the military, and I submitted it the day before Clinton announced he was lifting the gay ban. Anyway, in that, and by the way, that was published, the story about the publication of it, interestingly enough, is the dean of the Air War College was very much conservative Christian and anyway I asked him whether it would be possible to get it published and he said well normally we have to put you through a process that takes about six months but I will personally walk the paperwork through for you and we had it all signed off in 18 hours didn't hurt that he and I were in the same Sunday school class at church but at any rate in that book yes I went through the biblical case what the Bible has to say about homosexuality and that's what convinces me that's how I make up my mind but when I was asked later to come to Congress and to meet with congressmen and talk to them about this issue I didn't just say thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind it is abomination rather I used reason and evidence and to them I presented logic and evidence, statistics and the like, that should demonstrate even to somebody who doesn't care about the scriptures that having gays in the military does not comport with a fit fighting force and just is not a very good idea. Likewise on the abortion issue. I formulate my beliefs on abortion based on what the Bible says about when life begins. And the scripture very clearly says that life and personhood begin at conception. But again, when I'm arguing in a brief before the Supreme Court, I may cite some of that, but I don't rely on that primarily or exclusively. Rather, I present the case law, I present the medical evidence and other things that demonstrates that life does begin at conception, and therefore this is murder. The point being that in the church, we formulate our beliefs based upon revelation. In the public arena, we may formulate our beliefs based on revelation, but we have to be able to defend them and articulate them in terms of reason as well. It's been said that Luther was skeptical of reason, and he was in a way, at one point, he called reason a weather witch or the devil's prostitute, and one time said, nothing is so closely reasoned that it cannot be contradicted by counter-reasoning. He wasn't so much skeptical about the laws of logic themselves as he was about the way pe people, sinful people and limited people, use them. The old saying, statistics don't lie, or figures don't lie, but liars figure. And he said, be careful about it simply because of the way people misuse it. But... Nevertheless, he was not an opponent of reason itself. Another principle to understand with Luther, as we spoke about two weeks ago, sola scriptura, that is, scripture alone. Now, his belief in scripture alone, saying that scripture is the ultimate authority by which we judge all matters of faith, also meant that since the scripture speaks about matters of law and government, we look to what scripture has to say on these matters as well. But also, 
It led to widespread literacy. After all, if you're going to say that every plowboy should be able to read and interpret the scripture for himself, you better make sure every plowboy knows how to read. And so in Protestant countries, and frankly, Calvinist countries probably did a better job on this than Lutheran countries, we find a very strong emphasis on literacy. And that is one of the things that made Republican self-government possible. Another principle, the total depravity of human nature. In this regard, Luther and Calvin would be very close in their view of the total depravity of human nature. Luther would tend to see depravity more as a condition that we are in rather than a matter of choices that we make. But on that particular point, you'd find them in virtually complete agreement. But believing in the depravity of human nature had some political implications. First of all, it led to a fear of anarchy because we recognize then people are sinful. And if people are sinful, they certainly can't live without government. With that civil use of the law, as we spoke about it, we need civil government in order to restrain the exercise of sin. Without that, there would be no freedom at all. Everybody would be violating everybody else's rights all the time. But one thing about that doctrine of total depravity is that it is also a great leveler. What it means is that kings and princes and congressmen and police chiefs and all those in political authority have the same sinful nature as everybody else. And therefore, we can't trust them with too much power. Recognizing this, Luther said, and by the way, all of the quotes that I'm going to be using here are in volume three of my historical and theological foundations of law. There's a chapter there, the Lutheran Reformation and its effects on law, and then following it, a chapter on the Calvinist Reformation and its effects on law. But Luther once said, I will, if it please God, flatter no prince. But far less will I put up with the instigation of riots and disobedience among the common people to the contempt of temporal government. Another thing he said that I think most of us as constitutionalists would readily identify with, the experience recorded in all chronicles and in the Holy Scripture besides teaches this truth. The less law, the more justice. The fewer commandments, the more good works. No community that had many laws was ever, at least for a long period of time, well governed. So we recognize that we need a limited government, government somewhere between anarchy and totalitarianism. And he said between temporal government and a tyrannical rule, a permanent difference should certainly obtain. A tyrant takes from his subjects as long as he finds something to take. This privilege the Lord does not here want to concede to government. On the contrary, by the fact that he commands his subjects give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, he also wants to give governments or the emperors to understand that they are not to demand and take more than is theirs. Therefore, he distinguishes from that which is yours from that which is your own that you are to give to the government. For governments have not been instituted for the purpose of turning people into mere beggars and seeing to it that no one keeps anything. Taxes, revenues, or imposts are given to government that the subjects may retain their own, seek a livelihood, and honorably support themselves and those who are theirs. But when the need arises and one is called upon to do something for the maintenance of the common peace against enemies, no one should spare himself, but everyone should step to the side of government with body and possession to help. But aside from this common need, government should not rule in a tyrannical manner, should not impose too many burdens on its subjects, but should be satisfied with ordinary and tolerable taxes. Otherwise, it takes what is not its own and arouses the wrath of God, who has a way of punishing tyrants, foreign enemies, and other methods. Luther also said that in this way, there should not be a world government because each government is, in a sense, a check on other governments. Governments cannot go too far in abusing their people because there are other governments that may step in. And he said civil rulers need to realize that God has given fists to other people as well. 
One thing he said, and this is more prophetic, this really didn't happen in his day, but he's saying this is what he sees to be an ideal. Here you see that government should be elected by the votes of the people. Reason also dictates this. For to force a government upon a people against its will is perilous and pernicious. Now, as Luther himself said, at least I'm told that's what he said. I didn't hear him, but, you know, he was here a couple weeks ago, I guess. What Luther said a couple weeks ago is that he had studied law. In fact, he was almost finished with his legal studies when he was confronted with that lightning storm and chose to become a monk instead. But when he studied law, he studied the old Teutonic common law that existed in northern Germany, and in Scandinavia, a system of law that emphasized decentralized government, individual rights, and the unchanging nature of law. Each community had its own council. It was called an Althing, or in Germany it was called the Witton, in Scandinavia, the Althing. But anyway, this Witton that all free men were a part of, and they would meet Twice a year, the speaker, the law speaker, who was elected by the Vitton, he served a three-year term during which he was to recite a portion of the law at each, at each meeting of the all thing or the Vitton, so that everybody heard the law. It was the common law. And if he recited it wrong, there were people there who had been law speakers themselves who could correct him. And this way, law became truly common law. That was the system of law that Luther had studied and in which he believed. But in southern Germany, the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope and the Catholic Church were trying to impose the more centralized Roman law. The northern princes resented this. One of the things the northern princes liked about Luther was his belief in law. They liked his views of justification by grace and so on as well. But one of the things that attracted them to Luther was his emphasis on the decentralized Anglo-Saxon common law. That system that the Angles and the Saxons brought to England and that they in turn brought over to the United States. Another point is that God has established two kingdoms, church and state. We can see this going way, way back into the Old Testament. In fact, I argue that the first instance we actually see in history of true separation of church and state in the proper sense of the word is Old Testament Israel, where we see the civil authority, the kings, coming out of the tribe of Judah, and the religious authority, the priests, coming out of the tribe of Levi, separate offices, separate functions, but both derive their authority from God, and both are subject to the law of God. In the New Testament, you recall when the Pharisees confront Jesus with the question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus gives them an answer that doesn't fully answer their question. When you're the son of God, you don't have to fully answer a question. But he gives them something to think about far more than anything they'd thought about. Shows a coin, whose image is this Caesar's? And render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. That yes, Caesar has a legitimate area of jurisdiction. Lord Acton, writing about this passage, said that in this passage, Jesus gave to the state a legitimacy it had not previously enjoyed, that its power came from God, but he also placed upon the state a limit, that there was a jurisdiction that was beyond Caesar's authority. And he said, keeping the state within its appointed limits became the perpetual charge of the church. Throughout the Middle Ages, in Europe, we do see an emphasis on these two kingdoms, but they're handled in very different ways. You don't see kings becoming popes 
And you don't see popes becoming kings other than when we get to King Henry VIII in England in the 1500s. But prior to that, even though church and state intermingled with each other in many ways that were wrong, there was theoretically that separation. And the view, though, was different. In their view, you have these two kingdoms, church and state, but the church is the higher kingdom of the two. The church is above the state. And in fact, the state gets its power from God, but gets it through the church. That's why in the Middle Ages, frequently, they would want an emperor or a king, if possible, to be crowned by the pope, or at least a cardinal, if that were possible, to demonstrate that God, through the church, was giving the state authority. In contrast to that, you have the Anabaptists, and the Anabaptists would be very different from Baptists today. Anabaptists would be more like, say, Mennonite or Amish and so on. But the Anabaptists, who said that government, even if it was once ordained of God, is now under the control of Satan, and therefore we should have as little to do with government as possible. Yes, we have to pay our taxes, we have to obey the law, just so we don't get in trouble and so we have a good testimony. But we shouldn't serve in the military. We shouldn't hold public office. We shouldn't vote. And we shouldn't do any of the things that normally you'd attribute to citizenship. That was the opposite extreme. Luther was in between. Luther talked about the two kingdoms, church and state, the kingdom of the right, the church, the kingdom of the left, the state, and he used those terms long before left and right had ideological significance, but each of these has a special function. Neither is superior to the other, and both get their authority directly from God. As Luther put it, for this reason, these two kingdoms must be carefully distinguished and both be permitted to remain the one to produce piety, the other to create external peace and prevent evil deeds. Neither is sufficient in the world without the other. The role of the church is to preach the word of God, to convert people to Christ and to teach biblical principles. The role of the state is to preserve law and order, to protect our rights and to keep the reds or the redcoats or wherever they are off our shores. And these roles do not conflict. Rather, they complement each other. If the church is doing its job properly of training people in the word of God, they will be better citizens. And the state will have its job of governing far easier. If the state is doing its job of keeping the streets safe and protecting our rights, it'll be easier for the church to preach the word. So they complement each other. I believe you looked at the Augsburg Confession here this past month, haven't you? Um, this month we're doing the Canons of Door. But didn't, previously, didn't you look at the Augsburg Confession? Um, here and there, but not as, okay. as a focus. Well, the Augsburg Confession, drafted in 1530... <laughs> Luther's assistant, Philip Melanchthon, did the primary drafting of this, but Luther had a role in it as well. In Article 16, titled Civil Government, they simply say, It is taught among us that all government in the world and all established rule and laws were instituted and ordained of God for the sake of good order, and that Christians may without sin occupy civil offices or serve as princes and judges, render decisions and pass sentence according to imperial and other existing laws, punish evildoers with the sword, engage in just wars, serve as soldiers, buy and sell, take required oaths, possess property, be married, etc. And then, of course, in typical Lutheran fashion, they have to go on and condemn everybody else that disagrees with them, but we don't need to go into all of that. But Luther emphasized that 
We should be involved in civil government, and we should be training our young people to be involved in civil government. As he wrote on one occasion, it is certainly a shameful despising of God that we do not let our children perform this great and divine work and only put them in the service of the belly and of avarice. It is a shame that we let them study nothing except how to make a living, like swine wallowing forever in the mud with their noses, and do not train them to fill a position and walk of life so worthy. Surely we must either be made or without real love for our children. Moreover, and frankly I'm going to disagree with this, but he says, moreover, this position, that is, being a judge or being a magistrate or holding a position in government, this position needs abler persons than the office of the ministry. Therefore, it is necessary to keep the best boys for this work, for in the ministry, Christ does everything through his spirit. What do you think about that? Well, we know very well that a pastor needs to be a diplomat, a politician even, and the smaller your church is, the more diplomatic you have to be. <laughs> but, but anyway, but the kingdom of the world must use reason, from which indeed the laws have come. For God has subjected temporal rule in the things of the body to reason, and has not sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to do this work. Governing is, therefore, the more difficult task, for men cannot rule over consciences, and must, so to speak, act in the dark." On Christians using their positions in civil government, Luther said we should be using our position to stand for the principles that we know to be true from the word of God. He wrote, for example, since, this is speaking of the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire in the first paragraph, since then we have received this empire through God's providence and the schemes of evil men, I would not advise that we should give it up, but that we should govern it honestly in the fear of God, as long as he is pleased to let us hold it. The king of Babylon obtained his kingdom by force and robbery, yet God would have it governed by the holy princes Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Much more than does he require this empire to be governed by the prince, Christian princes of Germany, though the Pope may have stolen or robbed or newly fashioned it. It is all God's ordering, which came to pass before we knew of it. Now, before I close here, I'd like to address three myths about Luther's belief in law and government. First is that Luther believed that biblical law has no place in government. As I've emphasized, Luther would say that we need to be prepared to articulate our positions in terms of reason. But that doesn't mean we don't form them by revelation. And it does not mean that revelation has no place in the way we articulate them. In fact, Luther distinguished between three types of law. First of all, he said there is gesetz in the German, which means natural law. Then he said there's natural justice, which he used the term recht in the German. These have universal application. They apply everywhere. But then there are some parts of God's law that he says are, in his words, Saxon Spiegel, or that is laws that are unique to Israel and have no application to our society here today. The Ten Commandments, he emphasized, is very much part of the natural law guess us. In fact, he says, the Decalogue is not of Moses, nor did God give it to him first. On the contrary, the Decalogue belongs to the whole world. It was written and engraved in the minds of all human beings from the beginning of the world. Another occasion, in 1540, he wrote, natural law is the Ten Commandments. It is written in the heart of every human being by creation. It was clearly and comprehensively put on Mount Sinai, finer indeed than any philosopher has ever stated. Natural law then is created and written in the heart. It does not come from men, but is a created law to which everyone who hears it cannot but consent. On another occasion he wrote in 1523, a prince's duty is fourfold. It consists, one, true confidence in God and sincere prayer, two, in love for his subjects in Christian service, three, in a discriminating mind and unfettered judgment toward his counselors and men of influence, and four, in moderate severity toward 
evildoers. If he practices these virtues, his position will properly be taken care of outwardly and inwardly and will be pleasing to God and to the people. But he must expect much envy and trouble. The cross will soon rest on the shoulders of a ruler who has such a program. So Luther did see there definitely is a place for God's word in civil government. I would say that Calvin went a little further than Luther, particularly in emphasizing the role of the Old Testament. And certain Calvinist writers probably would go further than Calvin did in that regard. A second myth is that Luther was brutal and unsympathetic toward peasants. First of all, as we saw two weeks ago, Luther himself came from peasant stock. And when the peasants were making their demands for reform, he initially supported their demands. But it was only when the peasants turned to mob violence, including arson, rape of nuns, murder of innocent persons and the like, only then did Luther exhort the princes that they were to take action and to smite, stab, and slay them. But even then, he still urged the princes to temper their response and spare the innocent. In fact, Luther was very concerned about human life. He said, I am slow whenever life is concerned, even if the offender is exceedingly guilty. I can by no means admit that false teachers should be put to death. It is sufficient to banish them. And a third myth is that Luther advocated absolute obedience to civil government. Luther's whole career demonstrates the opposite of this. You may recall that two weeks ago we spoke about how Luther had to stand before the Diet of Worms there and where he refused to recant his writings and as a result he was condemned as a heretic and at that time the Holy Roman Emperor issued a decree that anyone who saw Luther was to slay or capture him well, the Elector Frederick of Saxony simply said, and this was Saxony was the province that Luther was from up there in northern Germany, the Elector of Saxony basically said, that ain't going to happen, not while I'm the Elector here. And you recall what he did, that he staged a kidnapping of Luther and staged it so well even Luther thought he was being kidnapped took him up to Wartburg Castle, where he lived for a year in hiding for his protection, where he was known as Junker Jorg, or Knight George, and where he translated the New Testament from the original languages, Hebrew, or not Hebrew in the New Testament, but Greek, into German. That was an act of interposition. Frederick there was defying the Holy Roman Emperor. And Luther didn't say, well, I'm sorry, Frederick, we can't do that. We have to submit it. No, he accepted that fully. Even the Augsburg Confession that we just read from supports obedience when government commands what the Word of God requires. But when government commands what the Word forbids or forbids what the Word commands, then, according to the Augsburg Confession, we must obey God rather than man. And it cites Acts 5.29 as the source for that proposition. Now, Luther developed his view over a period of time here. And I might say that Calvin was a little more outspoken in this area, partly because Calvin came a quarter of a century later and... Frankly, Calvin had the benefit of 25 years of Luther's developing thought. There are some who say that Luther and Calvin, and most will say that Luther and Calvin never actually met. They did correspond some. I was going to suggest when I was at seminary there that I was going to write my thesis on demonstrating that there actually was a meeting between Luther and Calvin. And in that one meeting... Calvin simply said to Luther, I have read your 95 theses. And Luther said, well, what did you think of them? And Calvin said, you nailed it. <laughs> I was strongly discouraged from writing my thesis on that topic. But 
Part of what developed Luther's thinking was the increasing pressure the northern princes found themselves under to conform to the Holy Roman Emperor, both in terms of the Catholic religion and in terms of Roman law. And gradually Luther moved from the position of saying we have to obey to saying that you have a choice of whether to obey or disobey to saying that we have a duty to disobey passively but not to actively resist to finally taking a position of interposition and resistance. And in 1539, he wrote that our princes have therefore decided that in such case, his imperial majesty is not emperor, but a warrior, servant, and robber of the pope, as the latter in such a war is the real leader and emperor. This is the attitude of our estates. The German princes have more right as against the emperor than the people in that day had against Saul and Ahikam against Jehoiakim. The emperor is not an autocrat, and it is not within his authority to depose the electoral princes and change the form and glory of the empire, and it is not to be permitted should he attempt it. Inasmuch as this could not and dare not be permitted in any way as affecting business matters and temporal affairs, how much less is it to be endured if his imperial majesty began to wage a war for a foreign cause, that is the Roman Catholic Church, and in the interest of the devil? If the majesty does not know that his cause is so evil, it is nevertheless sufficient for us that we know it and are certain of it. In 1550, a few years after Luther's death, the city of Magdeburg was surrounded by the armies of the Holy Roman Emperor, and the Lutheran pastors of Magdeburg came together and drafted what is known as the Magdeburg Confession. The Confession, part of it, simply articulates traditional Lutheran theology, but then adds that when magistrates, quote, persecute piety and uprightness, they remove themselves from the honor of magistrates and parents before God and their own consciences, and instead of being an ordinance of God, they become an ordinance of the devil, which can and ought to be resisted by his order for the sake of one's calling. Confession declares that this position be supported by natural law, and by German common law. I would say that in the area of church and state, and in the area of law and government, that Luther's message is relevant today. First of all, it is relevant to those of the radical separationist mentality, that they should remember that, yes, indeed, there are two kingdoms, But God is the Lord of both kingdoms, and God's law is relevant to both kingdoms. And also, I think Luther is relevant in Christian right circles today, and I certainly consider myself Christian right. But I think Luther is relevant there as a reminder that as important as biblical law is today, God has established two kingdoms. And I would suggest to you that much of the problem that we have in government today is when we ask one kingdom, the church, to do the work of the state, or ask the other kingdom, the state, to do the work of the church. Keeping those two kingdoms within their proper roles, that I would suggest is a contribution that Luther can make to the debate today. I was asked to say something in regard to veterans today and this being veterans weekend i will certainly do so the sheet i'm going to use here a reading on this subject i'm going to read this very quickly you can see it's pretty messed up because yesterday morning i had to read it out in the rain there at greenwood cemetery but we've got to dry it out but this comes to us from father dennis edward o'brien of the u.s marine corps by the way as i do this before i read it let me just ask all those who are have military service, if you'd please stand. I'm asking for Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Merchant Marine, Active Duty, Reserve, Guard. I'd ask all those who served to please stand. I guess there's two of us, okay? Anyway, I'd like to give this gentleman a great applause. 
And it does demonstrate something, too, that as time moves on, the percentage of a population in any gathering like this who have served in the military seems to be declining. The percentage of people who live in a family where there is a military person in the family seem to be declining. And if there is a widening gap between the military, the rest of our society, that may be part of the reason. But the reading that I'm going to give you here is, what is a veteran? Some veterans bear visible signs of their service, a missing limb, a jagged scar, a certain look in the eye. Others may carry the evidence inside them, a pin holding a bone together, a piece of shrapnel in the leg, or perhaps another sort of inner steel, the soul's ally forged in the refinery of adversity. Except in parades, however, the men and women who have kept America safe wear no badge or emblem. You can't tell a vet just by looking. He is the cop on the beach who spent six months in Saudi Arabia sweating two gallons a day, making sure the armored personnel carriers didn't run out of fuel. He's the barroom loudmouth, dumber than five wooden planks, whose overgrown prat frat boy behavior is outweighed a hundred times in the cosmic scales by four hours of exquisite bravery near the 38th parallel. She, or he, is the nurse who fought against futility and went to sleep sobbing every night for two solid years in Da Nang. He is the POW who went away one person and came back another, or else didn't come back at all. He is the Quantico drill instructor who has never seen combat, but has saved countless lives by turning slouchy, no-account rednecks and gang members into Marines and teaching them to watch each other's backs. He is the parade-riding legionnaire who pins on his ribbons and medals with a prosthetic hand. He's the career quartermaster who watches the ribbons and medals pass him by. He is the three anonymous heroes in the Tomb of the Unknown, whose presence at Arlington National Cemetery must forever preserve the memory of all the anonymous heroes whose valor dies unrecognized with him on the battlefield or in the ocean's sunless deep. He is the old guy bagging groceries at the supermarket, palsied now and aggravatingly slow, who helped liberate a Nazi death camp and who wishes all day long that his wife were still alive to hold him when the nightmares come. He is an ordinary and yet extraordinary human being, a person who offered some of his life's most vital years in the service of his country and who sacrificed his ambitions so others would not have to sacrifice theirs. He is a soldier and a savior and a sword against the darkness, and he is nothing more than the finest, greatest testimony on behalf of the finest, greatest nation ever known. So remember, each time you see someone who has served our country, just lean over and say thank you. That's all most people need, and in most cases it will mean more than any medals they could have been awarded or were awarded. Two little words that mean a lot. Thank you. It is the soldier, not the reporter, who has given us freedom of the press. It is the soldier, not the poet, who has given us freedom of speech. It is the soldier, not the campus organizer, who has given us the freedom to demonstrate. It is the soldier who salutes the flag, who serves beneath the flag, whose coffin is draped by the flag, who allows the protester to burn the flag. And with that, I'll say a blessed Veterans Weekend to all.